Amen. Hello and welcome to our midweek service uh, tonight, uh, Wednesday, the ninth, and we are gathered here uh, at the church. Uh, we're doing something a little bit different today. We uh, have a few things that have been going on within the church, and we are going to have no video tonight. Uh, because of some technical difficulty, I'm using a different device, which just allows me to duly record this service tonight, uh, September 9th, um, just video as well, at, I mean, without video, audio, so that we can also have this posted onto our um, YouTube page as well as our Activating Podcast on Spotify. If you haven't gone to Activating Podcast on Spotify, I encourage you to do that. Uh, it is uh, some uh, spiritual topics and church topics, but also some off-record uh, constitutional topics, whether regarding our first speech, uh, our First Amendment constitutional rights, which is also our freedom of religion, which many today will be dealing with uh, in regards to uh, the COVID-19 mandate, vaccine mandates that are actually plaguing into our communities today uh, with our executive branch leadership and his presidential uh, office of the White House has announced that employers with uh, 100 plus employees will be forced and mandated to uh, provide vaccinations required for all its employees, especially in the healthcare industry, anyone that's working for an agency that receives Medi-Cal and Medicare, so forth and so on. Tonight is really pretty much, a, I don't wanna say a heavy night, but um, I have been dealing with uh, different uh, strains, strands, if I should say, different strands of issues in regards to this COVID mandate and uh, some of the things that are being forced upon us as Americans. And when we think about that, it lies and ties into everything that is spiritual to us according to the word of God. And we're gonna look at that tonight. And uh, tonight, I'm gonna tell you, we had a powerful time tonight, uh, pre-church time, uh, if any of you are in relationships, uh, whether you're engaged or whether you're just dating someone, and I know in today's society, uh, that uh, can entail a lot of different aspects. Um, unfortunately, I've always looked at relationships as one way. Hey, you know, a man like myself asking a woman like my wife, Claudia, hey, woman, would you marry me? And then getting married and then working out those relationship ties. I know in today's society, we, we work that relationship mechanism or process in a whole different way. Uh, but I also was raised in the church and I understood it, that marriage was the most, the one and only covenant that God actually blessed. He didn't say parents, you know, you're married to your children until death do you part. Actually he says, that when our children grow up, they are to cut the umbilical cord of the mother. In other words, to tie that connection and uh, regain that connection with their spouse. We know that it's really the only covenantal uh, relationship, not only between God, where God says, let no man take apart what I brought together, uh, but also in society, it's the only relationship that we require a license and something that is confirmed through a magistrate, a judge, or, in like my case, an ordained minister of the state of California to marry or wed those two individuals as one. Why am I saying that? Because without those licenses, um, everything will eventually become hearsay. Just like we have no real license or certification of being American, except for citizenship, which is our social security card, our birth certificate. But in the mandates that are happening today, 
they are being forced upon us as Americans who dwell, live, and operate in a free society. And my point was in that whole marriage little side commercial is that we had a powerful time in talking, discussing, and counseling in an open forum here at church uh, on the subject of relationships. And so if you ever want to get to the church earlier than 730, send me a text. Give me a heads up. I, I will wait till the very last minute to come out and study. I'll be studying till the very last minute in prayer and so forth and so on. But if you let me know and you wish, because normally it's not the norm for people to show up at six o'clock or even 630, so forth and so on. And if I open up the curtains uh, that early and nobody's showing up, I'll get preoccupied by just uh, interruption. So I'd rather spend that time in prayer and that time in getting ready. Excuse me with the word for tonight. Tonight, we're looking at Romans chapter seven. And I want you to understand this because when we look at this portion of scripture, it is dealing with the area of our lives that, that when we come to the well, let's just say it right now, the mandates of our, our community or our nation right now with COVID is that we are, we have a law in the spiritual aspect, no different than the law of the land. That law, many times what people maybe don't really focus on, I pray they do, but maybe just in case we've been focusing on the wrong thing. The law of the land is not our spiritual law. The law of the land is our judicial law. And when we see this uh, confrontation with Jesus and the ch chief priests and the scribes and the Pharisees of the synagogue or quote unquote the church of the time, they brought a accusation against the disciples with their hands being clean and so forth and so on. And Jesus really looked at the things that we focus on the outside not relatively reflective on the things that are going on in the inside. As in other words, you can see somebody they may look like a mean person or they're always mad, but inside, you know, they're either hurting or inside they're just the most beautiful, happiest, joyful teddy bears that you could ever imagine to ever meet. And so we get these sayings like, do not judge a book by its cover. And we don't open that book unless we read those pages we'll really see what's inside. In that we have these laws of the land or when this accusation was brought to Jesus, we see that they asked him, who do they pay taxes to, God or to Caesar? Now Jesus corrected their request or their question because he put it on them in their own air of trying to take something, let's just say for the word for sake, carnal judicially the, the the laws of the land humanity so human law he said you're trying to take something that's human and create it and then cross-reference to something that is divine and god created and he told them give to what is caesar's give to what is god give to god what is god give to caesar what is caesar because they were using money and jesus was talking about the taxes of your life are actually the taxes of what we call in the church, the three T's to tithing. Tithing is represent as a tenth. So when in the Old Testament, which we're going to talk about because that refers to the law, a tenth was every farmer or every harvester was going to give from the first 10% of their flock or their harvest in their crops. And when we talk about tithing today, it is a tenth of percentage wise, a tenth of our earnings. So we tithe a 10%. So in other words, if I make $100, I'm going to tithe to God that I am blessed to receive and earn and have the opportunity to earn that $100. Now, in that respect, that $100 was actually a blessing from God. So in that, I'm going to give God my 
tithe or my tenth, which I will take $10 out of my $100 bill and I will give $10 to the Lord. Now, giving to the Lord today is not sacrificing the lamb. Or if you take $100 and buy groceries and then you take $10 worth of that groceries, lay them at an altar and sacrifice them, like pour out milk, leave cheese out there, grate it, shred it, whatever, and then get a piece of meat and cut it in chunks and then leave it at an altar for God. No, that is in the form of you bringing it to the house of the Lord. That's why when some people bring chips, some bring people bring water, uh, some people bring snacks, whatever it may be. I mean, that can be part of your uh, tithe. Now, we know that money makes the world go round, and so we have financial responsibilities like rent and different things. So giving a tenth of that earnings, which is $10 of $100, then we take that $10 and we use it to pay the rent or pay the light bill or pay the insurance or the non uh, or the incidentals of toilet paper, different things. And there's a lot of people that bring an offering, which is an offering of toilet paper, an offering of uh, paper towels. And, I, and I, I've had this in 20 years. People struggle with releasing $10 of $100 and they uh, will feel more prone to buying something and then bringing it to the church. That's fine. Because that trust doesn't really deal with me. The trust really deals with them and God. In other words, God said, give your tithe and then trust God that it's going to be used accordingly. So if you think about the size of our church and you think about the regular attendance of our church, in which why a lot of times I'll say you know, thank you, Lord, for those who send in their offerings and send in their tithes. Yesterday, uh, or actually, um, wait, today's Friday. No, where is it? No, today's Wednesday. So in, in, a, in a time where, um, I got a little mixed up on my days there. Anyways, um, it, this probably won't go up until Friday. It's probably what I'm thinking. Uh, by the time it gets edited and uploaded and gone through the precursors of YouTube world, right? But anyways, um, the reality is, is I've been called to go tomorrow, Thursday, to go pick up some tithes, tithes from some family members. And so, but when we look on a norm, those who come to the church, we can see that whether I'm giving or you're giving or somebody else is giving, if you do not see anybody giving, then obviously um, those funds come through another way. So a lot of times we may be uh, discouraged to give to the Lord because um, we're in fear that the money might be misused. But obviously for 20 years and out of those 20 years, 18 of those years right here in this particular building, the church is still remaining. So obviously that money is being used accordingly and righteously to keep this church up afloat and going. That being said, why am I talking about that tithe? Because we are to give God not only financially, the, the three T's of tithing, treasures, but also our time. So I always look at it as 24 hours in a day. That's 2.4 hours a day. So two hours and 40 minutes, I would say. Two hours and 40 minutes a day, I'm going to dedicate it to the Lord. And I don't mean just a devotional time, but a time to serve God. So coming to church for two hours on Wednesday, that's two hours out of your two hours and 40 minutes that you gave to the Lord. What do you do the other days? Well, there's a lot of things, but that's not what we're talking about. today. When you think about this law of that, the third T of that tithing is our talent. What we have a gift to do. Now, I have the gift of gap. <laughs> I'm a pastor, right? So I can talk and talk and talk and talk. When we look at these requirements, as we saw them in the Old Testament, they were stricken upon the people as a requirement, the law of spirituality. We also get the law of the Ten Commandments. And when we look at those Ten Commandments, we at many times think that when Jesus came, into play after his birth and his development as a young child into a young man. And then afterwards into his 
introduction into his earthly ministry for the three-year period, he would say something as to reference the law that he came to fulfill the law. So we think that all the law is lost in Christ Jesus. It's not lost. He didn't say I didn't came to abolish it. He, didn't, he said, I did not come to cancel it. I came to fulfill it in love. In other words, those requirements were first introduced to the people of God or the people of Israel as a way to measure and evaluate their way of living. And if they couldn't match up to these Ten Commandments, then they weren't living in accordance to God's desired plan. And so when we look at those Ten Commandments, we see that they're just measurements, evaluational points, or bullet points, and how we should be living first with God, the first four commandments, and then how we are to interact and live and have relationship with our fellow brother and sister, our fellow uh, uh, Americans or um, colleagues, our American citizens, our, our fellow citizens, so to speak. So in that realm of the latter six of the Ten Commandments, all deal with personal people relationships. And so there are bullet points of evaluation that would eventually be developed into a requirement. And hence why God had to send Jesus, not only because he says himself that the law will not equate to eternity. The law is not salvation. Because even if you follow all those laws, it does not make you a righteous person before God. The only way to reconcile ourselves out of the fall of man through Adam and Eve is to be reconciled to God. And we've been learning over that. And if you've been listening to the scriptures, and whether it's Romans chapter 5 or John chapter 21 and all these other things that we see that we've been reading, we see that it all has to deal with that love and grace of our relationship with Jesus Christ. So that also being said is because it's a foundation for the law. The law is the law. And it became more rigorous and more regimentedly required among the people. And if you broke one of those laws, you would be stoned. And we see that in the New Testament in one of the confrontations where Jesus is, is requested to stone a woman who's caught into adultery. That's still one, again, it's not the focus, but that's the end result. For the wages of sin equals death. We just read through that in chapter 6 of the book of Romans on a week ago, last Wednesday service. Now tonight, we're going into chapter 7, and we're talking about how we are freed from the law. Now, I want you to understand this. It does not mean that we do not adhere to the law, or we do not abide by the law, or we, for hence, you know, obey the law. But what, what it's going to help us see tonight is that we are freed from the law. I and mean, what is that law? That we're mandated, that we're required, that we are restricted to the laws of spirituality. When Jesus said he came to fulfill the law in love, it was because he was that love. He was that cross sacrifice, nailed to that cross. He was that altar sacrifice, that cross sacrifice, in which because in John 3, 16, the Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whomsoever should believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting or eternal life. And that in John 3, 17, that God did not send Jesus to condemn the world, but that through Jesus, the world might be saved. <clears throat> so in that whole understanding, we are freed from the law which is a law of requirement. It's which it developed into because those who were the, how do you say the, like in today, the law enforcement of the law, the law enforcers or the police of the law, which we call law enforcement today. The scribes and the Pharisees appointed themselves of being the law enforcers. And so when you broke that, they would impinge that punishment upon each breaker of the spiritual or what we and we don't have time to go into it tonight but the levitical law or the ecclesiastical uh, law of the land and so when we think about this um what do we mean 
through the word of God that we are freed from the law. So we're going to begin to read Romans chapter 7, beginning in verse 1. Or do you not know, brethren, for I speak to those who know the law, that the law has dominion over a man as long as he lives? That's normally the law. You're not going to get freed from it until you are dead. Or in sense, renounce that you are even under that law. So, and we'll talk, well, let's see if we can have time to talk about that. But that would be like a citizen of the American law, considering himself a sovereign citizen, that we're not required to be under American law, let's say for these mandates. But that also means we're not a citizen of this country. And if you and I are born in this country, or legally migrated to this country, and have gained citizenship of this country, then we would have to denounce that citizenship. Just as a side note, there are different ramifications when you are literally asked, have you denounced your citizenship? One case, um, when you purchase a firearm under the constitutional rights or the Bill of Rights of the Second Amendment, you are asked on your questionnaire, have you ever at any time denounced your citizenship to the United States of America? Because if you were to say yes, they would not allow you to purchase a firearm. Why would that be? Because you're no longer protected by those constitutional rights. Let's read on. Verse 2. For the woman who has a husband is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. If the husband dies, she is released from the law of her husband. If you could just understand that alone, you'll understand what this portion of scripture and chapter 7 of the book of Romans is referring to, we are freed from the law. Okay? Why would he use, Paul the apostle used, husband and wife? And I'm going to talk about that. He uses husband and wife because the husband is the headship or the leader. And yes, the dictator of what will be done in a family over the wife. Now, I'm not talking about a dictator like, a, a, a renaissance dictator, but I'm um, like when you take dictation on court hearings, there's a dictator that takes the dictation of what is being spoken. That is the husband's responsibility. Now, I know a lot of women will be offended by this, especially in today's climate, but this was God's plan, just like Adam and Eve. He was responsible, Adam was responsible for Eve. Now, that law. We also know is part of that curse law, where in Genesis chapter 3, when the woman and man fell, and I say that in that order, but really the man fell first because he did not provide security, intimacy, and comfort and reassurance to Eve, his wife. Therefore, she was able to listen to an outside voice, meaning the serpent, who brought her that comfort. She was going through a moment in life of dealing with insecurity and even being safe. And he fed on that. The serpent fed on that, which is Satan. He fed on that. He fed her a lie, which was truth and relative, but not truth in actuality. What is it relative? It was relative to God knowing all things. God knowing because he's the creator of all things. He knew good and evil, life and death, pain and suffering. And which was there rested in that fruit tree in the center of the Garden of Eden, in which he said to Abe, uh, Adam and Eve, do not eat. You can eat of everything, but do not eat of this one fruit of this tree. And because it would make them like, was going to make them God. Because the only way we can create is because God gave us in part of that curse, the redemption of women, which would be childbearing. I believe that if it was not through the fall of man, that God would just create babies. He would have just created it out of the woman. He would have pulled like he did out of the man, a rib. He would have brought a seed out of the woman and had children. But because man and woman fell and they knew now good and evil, life and death, pain and suffering, they would now be redeemed through that. The pain and suffering, the good and the bad, where man would be cursed to work six days a week, sun up to sundown, so forth and so on, and the woman would be redeemed, as it says in scripture, Genesis chapter 3, through childbearing. Now, with that said, the 
relative truth was they would become like God and know those things. Because up until that point, that was the only thing that they did not know. Anything else, we cannot be like, we cannot be God. We cannot create people um, like he did from mud and sand. And you know, we know scientists are trying to do all those things, but that's a whole different sermon. But what I'm saying is that they would be like God and know good and evil, life and death, pain and suffering. But the 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 real truth, the realistic truth, is that they weren't God. He and that was Satan's issue. He wanted to be God. He wanted everything that God was. And so there he for he forced his own sin upon them. And I believe that because of that, it wasn't that Adam and Eve just woke up one day and said, Hey man, let's just go party and have a good time and sin against God's order. They were coerced, they were influenced. Now, for a side point, no different when the scripture tells us that when we cause somebody to stumble, when we cause any children to uh, be prevented from coming to the Lord because we are mixed or wrong examples for them, so forth and so on. Um, we influence people to be unrighteous. We influence people to sin. There weights a heaviness of sin and consequence for that influence. It's throughout the whole Bible, especially in the New Testament. That's another sermon there. Now, that being said, that's why the curse was so heavy on the serpent, because he influenced them to fall in their sin. But God's love and grace is so efficient that he, he still gave them life. He did not allow them, Adam and Eve, to perish at their moment. But he gave them a, a, a process of restoration. Adam, you go out there and toil and you work. And by that, you will be redeemed. And that's why many times, as I was saying last Sunday, that's why many times we find that value in what we do at work because it's part of our restoration. But it's really dealing with our spiritual restoration that we are redeemed as fathers and husbands and providers. And so same thing with the woman and her childbearing. And that's why I believe the enemy uses that parental ship sometimes as a hindrance where people will walk away from the Lord because of their children. And so forth and so on. What I mean by that is uh, I, I was confronted with issues like that with both my children having disabilities. Uh, my son more visual, more apparent, more obvious than my daughter. But my daughter does has Asperger's and she uh, is considered partially disabled because of that inability uh, to uh, evaluate social norms and different things. But because she's high functioning as a font in like her ability to to, to, to sing and play an instrument, all these other things. Um, it's sometimes not obvious. And so people don't look at that as a disability. But anyways, in all those things, it's many times people will walk away from the Lord because they'll be angry at God for what the condition of life the children have to live. Does that make sense? So that's not our focus tonight, but our focus is being free from that law. And so that law is that you have to work and that you would have to bear children. So we're required. Oh my God, I have to give child, you know, you know, must I feed you again today? You know, man, didn't I feed you yesterday? And so forth and so on. And so uh, husband's going to work and man, you know, all I ever do is work and bring you money and then you spend it. So we're, we're tied to this because it's a requirement in order for you to be deemed a, a good mother or a good, a good husband, you have to go to work and you have to take care of your children. But when Jesus fulfilled that law in love, it means that there's a difference of being under the hand of that law and forced to do those things rather than loving to do those things, just like the wife and the husband. He says to them, the wife is under the law of the husband until he is dead. As long as he lives, she'll be under that law because that's a covenant. We made a covenant with God when we were born. Our parents made that covenant when they brought us into this life. And that covenant is automatically passed on to you and I. It's no different sidestep for spirituality into carnality, civilization, humanity, no different than you being born here in America and your parents passing on your citizenship into this American way of life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness. And so as that's passed on, we're living under that passing because of birth. We're born in America. So we are Americans. No different in our spirituality. And so we now have that covenant to live and to bear children, to work and to care for children, so forth and so on. 
Now, the difference is once that husband dies, we're freed from that law of the husband. Now, I want you to catch this. When you look at Jesus and you look at the, at the church, we can see a husband and a, and a woman, a husband and a wife. And I want you to understand this because God is the bride. Or we, many times when we're referring to like, see, Matthew 25 and the bride, the 10 versions, the bridegroom is coming, which is Jesus. He's the bridegroom and the virgins, the women, the bride is the church. And so in that, we, the church, are under the law of God until death. Till death. You get that? The husband, the woman is under the law of the husband until death. We've been forced to be under the law. It is a requirement. If you did not follow Ten Commandments, if you did not follow spiritual regiment, infringement of rights being forced upon the people of God. It wasn't until death of the husband, death of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary, then we were freed. From being mandated, come on somebody, under that law. And now that Jesus Christ has died on the cross, we are freed from the mandate of that law. Look what it says, verse 3. So if then, if while her husband lives and she marries another man, she will be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is free from the law, so that she is no adulteress, though she has married another man. Because we... Uh, would break that law. We're married to the legalistic ways of the church. But when Jesus died, which he fulfilled the law in love, meaning for God, so you, you get all this? Are you getting this? It all comes together. It's the word of God. So the Christ, God, the bridegroom, we, the church, the bride, the woman, the bride, and therefore we're always under that law because the man took the Ten Commandments and the Levitical law and the ecclesiastical law of the land, the Mosaic understanding of the law, and then it got manipulated to this infringement of mandates and forcibility onto God's people, where there was so much segregation and even, for lack of better words, discrimination, whether you were a Jew or not. If you were Samaritan, you couldn't hang with the Jews. And so we saw that even from biblical time. We were mandated. We're married to it. That's the only thing we had. We served that law. But Jesus came to fulfill the law in love. And now he fulfills that law in love. What love? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whomsoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That love is that he gave his son to be crucified on the cross. Therefore, Christ died fulfilling the love of his father for you and I. And now as that, like that husband, we are freed from that law and free to marry whatever we want. You're free to marry the law of the land, whether it's judicial, uh, citizen-wise, judicial, humanistic-wise, the law of the government. And you're free to marry the law or be engaged to serve and uphold the law of the, of the spiritual, uh, uh, legalistical laws of the church, or you're free to be in, in, in relationship with Jesus Christ and wed it to that spiritual law through the Holy Spirit. Are you getting this tonight? Come on, somebody. Verse 4, therefore, my brethren, you also have become dead to the law through the body of Christ. You get that? You have become dead to the law through the body of Christ. Not because you died, but because he died. That you may be married, oh, come on, somebody, to another, to him, to Jesus. So that broke us from the law of the church to be law, to be married to the Savior. Oh, come on. I, I love the word of God, man. I love the word of God. And too many people do not read it and study it, or else you would be excited with this stuff as I am. You are free to be married to another, which is to him, Christ Jesus, who raised from the dead, that we should bear fruit to God. Come on, somebody. Women bear children when they're married, amen, to their husband. Or unfortunately, there are some that are not married, but you get my point. To the man, to the husband, to the father. Come on, somebody. And we, now being freed because of death, Christ on the cross, 
freed us from the legalistic law of the, uh, of the church and, leg and, and freed us from the legalities of the humanistic, socialistic, judicial law of the land. Come on, somebody. Why henceforth you could ask and be part of a mandate, whether it's because of medical reasons or religious reasons. Come on, somebody. And I encourage you to call me if you have any questions regarding that and requesting something like that. Now, here's the thing. The Bible says, and that is when it says in the end of, of verse four, that we should bear fruit to God. Everything we bear spiritually in our marriage to Christ, through Christ to God, is to bear fruit to him. Not to ourselves, not to America, not to the church, come on somebody, but to God. In verse five, for when we were in the flesh, the sinful passions, which were aroused by the law, we're at work in our members to bear fruit to death. In other words, before Christ died on the cross, we were married to the law of the church, the legalistic ways of being Christians and disciples and church members and so forth and so on. But that only led to the fruit bearing to the church, but equal to death. We were not going to get saved by following the Ten Commandments. That's why God gave Jesus, which he is our savior. And so now when we look at this in verse six, but now we have been delivered from the law, having died to what we were held by. Come on, somebody. So that we should serve in the newness of the spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. And we're going to talk about this on Sunday, uh, that word spirit as a continuance. And then introducing the fact of uh, verse 7, the sin's advantage in the law. In verses 7 um, uh, through, I would say, 12, maybe even into 13 and 21. Okay, anyways. So what does that mean for you and I? As I close here, we are free to love the woman and the husband. They're no longer under that law. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, he gave us the freedom uh, of relationships. And now a woman can be adhered. And I want you to know there's still that curse. Men still have to work uh, sun up to sundown seven days a week. Women still have to bear children. But there's a newness in spirit. I want you to know that. Think about that in verse uh, six. In the newness of spirit and now in the in, in the, in the uh, rather not in the oldness of the law. In other words, women were under the dictatorship of man back in the under the law. Women had no rights, women had no voices. Husbands were just free to be jerks. If I could say that on church broadcast, they could just be straight jerks and really nothing holding them accountable. But when Jesus died on the cross, he gave us the fulfillment of everything he taught his disciples through the three years of earthly ministry that we have in the New Testament of the word of God, Matthew all the way through Revelation, especially in the synoptic gospels, which is Matthew, Mark, Luke, amen. Uh, and John is associated with it, but the synoptic gospels is really Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And John takes a whole different turn into that, but uh, he's, Connected, but the synoptics are the three disciples that say the same story, but tell it in a different way. Uh, the gospel of John is like a gospel in its own. And that's why a lot of times when people get saved, they'll say, what do I read first? They say, read the gospel of John, because that's really our relationship with Christ. But the three accords of those disciples, Matthew, Mark, Luke, they talk about the same thing, but in their own accord of their witness to what was taking place. It's differently voiced, differently viewed, and differently witnessed, but say they all the same thing. And what I'm saying to this as I close tonight is that the fact that you and I are free from that law, a wife no longer is mandated to serve her husband and be under that regimen. Why? Because let's go to the head of the household, the husband. He's no longer given a free reign under the legalistic ways of man in the Old Testament. He is now adhered to. One of the teachings of Jesus Christ when he told his disciples and husbands love and water, love your wives as Christ loves the church. 
and water your wife with the word of the living God. And so now we're no longer able, as in the Old Testament, being married to the old letter of the law. Just command our women to do whatever we want them to do. Now we are to speak gently and speak spiritually to them. And I want you to understand this, that I learned this very early on as a young adult, especially as a teenager, but experienced it and experienced it overwhelmingly as a husband with my wife of nearly 24 years. Because everything I did was not out of command and demand. Come on, somebody. It was not out of command and demand. But rather, it was out of one thing. It was out of, as a husband, what I was able to so freely, compassionately, and passionately through love in Jesus Christ, I reaped as a dividend and an outcome of that love. In other words, my wife many times, and I know God says the same to you and I, but my wife many times would tell me, you make me, well, let's keep this rated G. You make me want you more and more every day. Now, I want you to understand this because the woman was cursed during her fall as Eve that she would desire her husband all her days of her life. Now, that desire wasn't like Sansom and Delilah. You know, hey, big hunk of man, come, come over here, you sexy thing. No, she would desire his authority. She would desire his position. She, he would, she would desire his power. And he, she would desire his position of command. And that's why many times today we look at women and we say these jokeful things, but they are actually spiritually embarrassment. But, you know, women want to run the home. Women want to be the man in the house. That's actually a curse. And because they desire that position that the man holds by default. Now today, our civilization and humanity and the marriage spiritually has defaulted and decayed and defrauded the institution of marriage between a husband and wife and a family. How's that? Well, because today there's no longer a default to the man. The man must adhere to the teachings of Jesus. And he must follow those as an exampleship and then be that exampleship to those whom he serves. He serves his wife as Christ loves the church, waters his wife with the word of God, and then cares and raises and trains his children in the ways of God. And so he must be not only a speaker of those things, but a doer of those things. Come on. Not just a talker, but also a walker of those exampleships. And so a man today is not default by default the commander and the demander. And so I learned that because there is that time where my wife would tell me, I desire you, man. Like nothing before. Like nothing I've ever imagined. And what that meant was that she freely was freed from that demand to command legalistical just default that a man had but now she was willing to you know throng herself into the care of her husband in which my wife was able to say in the latter part of our marriage you are my provider you are my carer and she said and now I am your helpmate and I serve you to fulfill the desires of Christ Jesus' wants. To be able to please him through faith that you, my husband, will be a man of God and lead and guide us in the ways of God. Oh, how beautiful is that? Now, I want you to understand this, that you and I are free from the law, that we are not required to come to church, but we love to. We're not required to have a relationship with our leadership, our pastoral leadership, but you're free to. What does that mean? You know, hey, pastor, how are you doing today? Hey, pastor, I prayed for you today. Hey, pastor, is there anything the church needs? Hey, pastor, is there anything I can do in the church? Hey, pastor, is there anything 
that the church could use for my family. Uh, we're free. We're not mandated. The three T's of tithing, our time, our treasure, and our talent, that we're no longer mandated to give that tithe or that tenth of a $10 of every $100 to the Lord. No, but we're free to because we believe and we're free from that old letter of the law that it was required. I mean, they tell you in the Old Testament, if you did not give your 10 sheep out of your under uh, new harvest of sheep, you were you were stoned, man. You were you were outcast. You were ridiculed. But today, no. You can't help me but find reasons to give to God. Because I'm so free from the law because of the death of Christ, the death of the bridegroom of, of the church. I am freed from that old letter of the law. And now I'm free to love. And I want you to understand this. Yet, you know, the, the reality is, is that whenever it, we go out to do something, uh, I'll, you know, I always want to bless people. Why? Because I just can't help but want to love people. And when people figure that out, they want to also be a blessing because they know I want to be blessed. And I'm so deeply blessed, whether it's going out to dinner and I can afford to bless the person with me. I do it because I love and I'm free to do that. You don't have to be my son. You don't have to be my my dad or my mom, you know, in order for me to bless you. You know, we go to Matthew chapter 13 and we'll see what Jesus says. My family is those who do the will of the father. So I close. Amen. And tonight I pray that you are blessed with this message because you're free. You're free to come to church. You're free to read your word. It's no longer a requirement where people like husbands have to go to church. I go to church because my wife's speaking. No, I go to church because, man, I'm free to go. And I freely choose to go because I love Jesus and all that he's done for me and all that he's going to do for me and all that he does for my kids, even when I'm unable. See, when you and I as parents are unable to be there with our children all the days of our life and they're gone and they're doing their own thing, He's watching out for our children because we can't be in two places at one time. But he's omnipotent and omnipresent. He can. He knows everything and he can be everywhere at all at the same time. And so I love you, church, and I pray for you tonight that you will understand how free you are from the law because of the death of Christ Jesus, the bridegroom of the church. We are free to be married to another, which is God through Jesus Christ. And when we talk about, when you hear single women, many times men don't do it. Uh, I, I don't even ever think I've heard a man say it, but I know women will say it. I'm married. I got a husband and his name is Jesus. I got a man and his name is Jesus. And so the reality is, amen, it's no different whether you're male or female, because he fills those absent, absentee voids, amen, where the world would love to fill them, amen. Uh, I, I couldn't imagine being out in the dating arena and how many uh, Women out there would be willing to fulfill that arena, but it's not, there's no vacancy. Why? Because the same love I had for my Savior and my God and for my Jesus was no different than when I was married. Jesus was my first. Jesus was my everything. And Jesus was my all. And my wife was number one. But how can you have two number ones? I, the, the reality of loving God is as much as you can love your wife and your children, you love God that much more. And the more you love your wife and your, your, your children or your husband, you will love even God more than that. And so that's where that love comes in, that I love God first, that I serve God first. But my wife is number one. And then my children are, are there in that lineage of importance. But I'm freed from the law that I'm required to love God. And so when you get up to pray and you go to bed tonight, and you, you lay yourself down in the evening, you're free to go to sleep or you're free to love God and talk to him and pray. You're free to get up and listen to whatever music you want to, drink whatever you want to, eat whatever you want to, live on however you want to. But in that freedom, you're also free to say, I'm so free that I choose to live right for God, to, to keep my body as a temple, holy, and pure. I, I choose to take my time to serve the Lord and, and be with them and be with other brothers and sisters. The Bible tells us in the book of Psalms, amen, that I believe it's Psalms 53 or 35. But the reality is that we, how beautiful are those who dwell together in the spirit of the Lord. It is beauty to God's eyes when we dwell together in harmony and in fellowship and in unity. But you're free. You're free today to tell somebody that Jesus loves them. 
Not required because the pastor told you to. You're free to evangelize and outreach to a, a, a soul out there, but not because it's a, a scheduled a, a, a time frame on the calendar of the church, but because you love God, you're free to do those things. So tonight, amen, I pray, Father God, in the name of Jesus, that the spirit of this letter, the spirit of this message will break us from the old letter of the law that we're mandated to do these things. Oh, if I want to stay saved, I got to, you know, pray, you know, three times and read the Bible, you know, three verses in the Bible every, every day, you know. No, God, because we're freed from the law because of a death, a death being you, Jesus, in which you said, I came to fulfill the law. The, the, the spiritual law of the church, and yes, even the law of the land. And I don't serve my country because I'm forced to serve my country, but I'm free to love my country as a patriotic citizen, an American citizen, and also as a veteran of the United States Armed Forces that I freely love to protect and, and stand to protect the Constitution of our United States for both against foreign and domestic terrorism. For those who are unfortunately unable to protect themselves, I will stand in the gap for them. Not because I'm forced, but because I love my fellow Americans, my fellow humans. But moreover, God, in the spiritual law of the land, I love my church, I love God's people, and I'm here to serve them freely. So Father, I pray today, when we've been operating under the requirement of the old letter of the law, please forgive us tonight when we've been forced to go to church, when we've done things out of mandate, and rather out of the spiritual freedom of the spirit, as it said in Romans chapter seven, verse six. And we're gonna define that word on Sunday, or if there's a Bible study, we'll do it before then, whatever it takes. But God, forgive us when we just operate it under the requirement, regiment, the command and demand of the law of our spiritual church and our in the spirit of our judicial law. Father, today, many people are being confronted and, 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 and many people, God, are being attacked with the mandate to be vaccinated and different things, God. And there are many people that are praying against this assault we're praying against this assault. And it seems like every day or every other day you have me on the phone with someone who's dealing with this, whether they work for the government, in the military, or because their employer is mandating certain things. Even the fear of, of doctors stating they don't even want to see patients no longer who are not adhering to this mandate. And you know what? My physician, Jesus Christ, in my healing, Jehovah Jireh, my provider in Jehovah Rapha, my healer, will supply my needs and heal all my diseases. And I believe that because unless it's my time to go, I'm not going to die. You're not going to die, beloved, unless it's just your time. And no vaccine's going to save you from your time in that order of God's plan. No, no, no bubble that you can hide in. No staying away from the church can prevent you. The reality is if you die from getting a disease or you die from an accident or horrible attack uh, or, or even in an auto accident or because of some sickness, it wasn't that which took your life. It is by the means that you perish, but God had his plan that it was going to be your time when that time comes. So in that God tonight, we trust you, we serve you, and we praise your holy name. Church, God bless you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. God bless you tonight. Like I said, we did not have any um, uh, video, but uh, I pray that you are blessed by this message. Uh, on Wednesdays, because of my son, he, you know, we're trying to get him back on his track. Uh, we had been up, amen, uh, uh, since uh, really like Monday afternoon. Uh, and then Tuesday morning, we stayed up uh, probably took a nap um uh you know monday uh, monday evening and then but tuesday morning we got up around one o'clock in the morning and uh then tuesday evening the same thing we were trying to get back on that cycle and we had stayed up from two o'clock in the morning on 
Tuesday all the way through Wednesday today. And tonight, my son's going to crash out on time. And uh, we'll be back on our routine of rotation. But it took a lot of sacrifice to get there. And so my son, uh, being able to run around and be throughout the church, uh, we had service in the cafe. We're remodeling. So we got my backdrop, this couple of fishing poles that I brought in from our trip. But we got flooring and paneling. And so sometimes video just works out better when we're in the cafe. We got people walking around getting uh, ding-dongs and different things. But um, and allows us to still get the message out. God bless you. We love you. Uh, you know, uh, we're working on a Friday night Bible study. If you uh, want to have a Bible study at your house, I know I reached out to a couple of families in Pomona to get that going again. But if you live locally by the church and you want to get together, I personally will come and teach the Bible study at your home on a Friday. And uh, it could be, uh, if you're not coming to church, uh, it could be a, a reacquaintance of the, you know, the church coming to you. But if you want to have people to come and visit, it could be that time for people to come and visit. God bless you. I didn't want to keep this long tonight, but we bless you. And uh, for those of you, amen, uh, that are planning uh, and praying about Sunday, please get to church. We love you. It'll be a powerful time in the Lord. God bless you uh, and have a powerful rest of the week. Amen. Praise the Lord.